Hello everyone and welcome to this edition of the online distilling conference. We are looking at Rye Whiskey 101. So you want to make rye whiskey? So the aim of this talk is to describe the, the basic sort of an introduction to production of rye whiskey. I know that there's a lot of people both in Europe and particularly in the UK that are interested in maybe starting rye whiskey production and we have a great special guest to tell us all about it. It is the one and only Mr Stephen Gould from Golden Colorado, Master Distiller at Golden Moon Distillery. Hello, Steve. Hey, David, how are you? Very good, Hi, everybody. You so I'm Stephen Gould. I'm the founder and master distiller here at Golden Moon Distillery. Um, I also work part-time in Ireland as a master distiller for a large whiskey operation there. And today we're just gonna talk about rye whiskey. Uh, this, is a, this is an overview, it's sort of an introduction. Uh, I'm not gonna go too in, in depth in chemistry or microbiology or et cetera, but we're gonna talk through the basic process of what rye whiskey is and how it's made and where it comes from. So with that, let's get started. So we're gonna start by defining rye whiskey. We're gonna go over a little brief history, some basic fermentation theory, some, an overview of raw materials used in rye whiskey production, raw material processing, we're gonna to touch on yeast, fermentation and what gives rye whiskey its flavors. So the trade definition of rye, and of course this is debatable, but most people in trade around the world would agree that it's any distilled spirit produced from grain, uh, distilled to less than approximately 95% ABV, that retains the flavor and aroma of the raw material used to produce it. It's almost always aged in wood containers and various regions will have stylistic and legal requirements. Rye in particular would be made from rye and other grains, and it should have the distinct characteristics of a rye distillate, which is flavor and smell that is spicy and earthy that really reflects the material it was made from. Now, having said that, you're gonna go in places around the world and there's going to be whiskeys that in one country would be called a bourbon, one country might be called a malt, but that in the country they're produced in, they're calling them a rye. And they do have a character of rye, but they would not meet the legal definitions for rye in say the United States. So the United States, obviously, since we're talking rye, uh, rye is, um, pretty uniquely an American creation. Uh, the Canadians will tell you what they're making is rye, and that's up to a lot of debate. But what people consider as rye whiskey is usually viewed as American rye whiskey. So in the United States, our general class of whiskey for under our laws, um, again, spirits are still from fermented mash of grain at less than 95% alcohol by volume having the taste, aroma, and characteristics generally attributed to whiskey and bottled at not less than 40% alcohol by volume or 80 proof under US proof. One of those 41 types is rye whiskey. It must be produced at not exceeding 80% alcohol by volume and, ferment, and from a fermented mash of not less than 51% rye grain, stored in a cask, at not more than 62.5% alcohol by volume, 125 proof. And it must, be, it must be aged, stored at some point in its maturation process in charred new oak containers. So unlike other countries where you can put something into a used barrel and call it whiskey, in the US it still much, must touch new oak to be whiskey to be a designated whiskey. It can be a white whiskey without touching new oak, but to be a rye whiskey, it must, must touch new oak. We also have another categorization called rye malt whiskey. that has the exact same definition, except it's made from malted rye. So a brief his history of rye whiskey. So what we're looking at here is a pretty typical layout for a distillery in the 16 and 17 and early 1800s in Europe and the United States. Much like you see in Scotland today and in many places around the world, 
you see two pot stills, one that was probably used as a stripping still. So in other words, taking the wash or the mash, and we'll talk more about what that is in a second, uh, and running it to get an initial distillation. And you come out with what we call low wines, which contain 20 to 25% alcohol by volume. And then a second still where you're gonna redistill that to get a higher level of alcohol, uh, typically anywhere from 60 to as high as 80% alcohol by volume that you'll then deproof for your final spirit, your final whiskey. So rye was a common crop in Western Europe uh, in the Middle Ages and up until the colonial period. Um, it was likely used very early on as the distilling grain. The thing about distillers, uh, especially historically, is that they would distill, and I should say we would distill, uh, pretty much off any fermentable we could get our hands on. And before there were definitions, anything you could make alcohol out of was fair game. Now, as we all know, the ingredients affect the final product and the flavor. But in the early days of distillation, they just wanted alcohol. And they would very often mix it with other things. They would imbue it with herbs, spices, botanicals for medicinal purposes. Um, so lots of stuff was distilled, but rye grew very, very well in certain parts of Europe. It was very easy to grow, which made it an easy target for distillers because it was an easy fermentable. So as we said, rye whiskey is typically associated with whiskey produced in the United States. So the first recorded use in, Amer in the Americas was in the Dutch colony of New Amsterdam, um, which is what we would now call New York and that part of the United States, where the, the governor of that colony, uh, and this is before the British came, um, ordered the distillation of rye, rye grain that they were growing into spirit for consumption. That rye was likely brought to the colonies by the Dutch and German colonists that came into that part of the United States early on. Doesn't mean it wasn't brought by other colonists later or earlier, but we know that the rye that was cultivated where it was first, we have records of the first distillation was cultivated in what was a Dutch colony. Now it was very, very popular in, in uh, at least the central and northern colonies of the 13 original American colonies uh, because it grew really, really easy. And it grew better than corn, it grew better than other grains. So rye became the preferred grain of choice in the Americas. And you saw this in what we now call Canada as well um, to distill off of. And it was so incredibly popular that up until uh, our prohibition in the 1920s, the vast majority of distilled spirits produced in the United States were produced off of, of rye grain in some way, shape or form. That does mean there weren't other grains used and we'll talk about why that is in a second. But what that means is what we would view as rye whiskey today was the predominant spirit in the Americas until the United States went into prohibition in 1920. Now, early rye whiskey was an unaged spirit. So basically they were running it on the still, they were putting into a cask and selling it immediately. Sometimes they were literally filling it off the still. Um, in the early days, they didn't really understand heads cuts and tails cuts and et cetera. So the spirit was pretty rough, um, pr pretty oily, probably had a fair amount of methanol in it. Um, it was pretty rough stuff. Uh, by the mid 1700s, people figured out because they were using barrels as containers, that if you let it sit in barrels for a while, it would take on a little bit of the oakiness and it would start to smooth the flavor out a little bit. So starting in the mid 1700s, you see distilleries selling a base grade product, which was clear and a product that might be aged a few weeks or a few months, that would be the premium grade. We also saw spirits beginning to increase. Um, I love this picture. I figured I'd throw it in here. This is a picture of a bunch of drunken sea captains in the colony of Rhode Island from 1758. And you can see there's something on every table and whiskey consumption um, uh, 
as well as other alcohol, but whiskey was, was a very readily available commodity in the colonies, uh, began to increase. Um, good thing to note here is shortly after the American Revolution, um, whiskey was so common in the Western frontier uh, that uh, it was used as currency. And that was because the farmers in the West wanted to be able to sell their goods in the East. When I say the West, we're talking places like Western Pennsylvania and Western Virginia, which now would be considered the Eastern United States. But those are the Western frontier in those days. Um, they found that they could distill their products, their grain, ship it to the East and make a profit without having to haul all that grain to the East. And so it was used as currency. And what that led to was America's first civil war, the Whiskey Rebellion, when um, uh, Thomas Jefferson, uh, one of our early presidents, decided to put a whiskey tax on, on the whiskey. And immediately the Western, the Western territories rebelled. And the, the former president, General George Washington, put his general's uniform back on and led an ar armed column into the West. And the rebellion immediately ceased because nobody wanted to fight George Washington. So talking about Washington. So after Washington retired from politics, um, because the whiskey business was booming, he decided to build a distillery on his estate in Mount Vernon. And it became one of the, the largest and most successful distilleries in the young United States. And it produced for sale exclusively rye whiskey. Now we have evidence that other spirits were produced at the distillery uh, but they were only used by Washington and his family. And those would have been peach uh, brandy and apple brandy. And they were only produced in small, small quantities, typically only during harvest season. And the records at Mount Vernon show they were transferred all to the estate in Mount Vernon and none of it was sold. It doesn't mean none of it was really sold. It just means that none of it was recorded as being sold. Anyway, so George Washington produced Rye whiskey, he was not the first rye whiskey distiller in the US, not by a long shot, but he was a significant producer around the year 1800, um, shortly before he died. And as you can see with the stills he's distilling on, again, they're very similar pot stills, much like the stills we, I showed you earlier. So throughout the 1800s and up until the 1920s, uh, rye whiskey was, was produced and consumed in massive volumes in the United States, and for that matter, in Canada, though the Canadians produce it a little differently, the whiskey they were producing was still majority of, of the fermentable was rye. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about making rye. Now, obviously the picture on the left is a glass of rye whiskey sitting on a bunch of rye grain. Um, the picture on the right is, is a very cool little picture from, of all places, the Encyclopedia Britannica, but it really gives a very high level overview of grain going into the silos, then being ground up, being cooked, and we're going to talk about why we need to cook certain grains in a second, cooled down, mashed, put into a, a fermenter, fermented, then distilled, then taken into storage containers, brought into a barrel, aged, and then bottled. And all whiskey is pretty much made this way, but malt whiskey does not require a, an additional cooking, where whiskeys made from other grains because of a high gelatinization temperature do require an additional cooking. We're going to touch on that multiple times in a second. So we're going to talk about basic, basic fermentation now. And fermentation is the same for all things you're fermenting using yeast. So this is alcohol beverage fermentation. We're not going to talk about other types of fermentation for things like um, um, sauerkraut or kimchi or et cetera. Uh, process is the same, but the microorganisms involved are different. So fermentation for our purposes is the breakdown of sugars by microorganisms, typically yeast, to produce ethyl alcohol, carbon dioxide, and small amounts of other products. Now those small amounts of other products are important because those are our flavor conjugates. So 
while the vast majority of what comes out of fermentation is either going to be ethanol or carbon dioxide, that little teeny bit, which is typically less than 5%, is going to be what gives your whiskeys your flavor and character. So distillers will refer to the sugar solution we're working with as wort, sometimes unfermented mash or wash. A mash has solids in it and a wash does not. So talking about rye whiskey, a rye whiskey is gonna be done from a mash and I'll explain more about that later. Uh, malt whiskey will typically be done from a wash. A fully fermented mash or wash if it's laudered, and we'll talk about that in a second, uh, is referred to as mash, beer, or simply fermented mash. Laudering is the process of separating solids from liquids. So for malt whiskey, for beer, you're gonna to wanna to take and separate the solids, the husks out of that liquid. And the reason you wanna do that is with, with large quantities of husk from barley, you can get an astringent and grassy note in your spirit that you don't want. So you're gonna to wanna to try and separate that out. With whiskeys made from wheat, rye, or corn, because you're going to have to gelatin, gelatinize at higher temperatures, laudering is typically not done, though some people do it, because you'll lose 40 to 6% of your fermentable. Because you're cooking the grain to the level where you break down the husks and the solids to the point where it's very difficult to get that liquid out of it and retain the sugars you want. So microorganism. Microorganism is a small living cell, typically only visible by microscope at a magnification of 100 times. The microorganism we really care about right now for this discussion is yeast. And in particular, it's a certain family of yeast called budding yeast. And then we care about enzymes. So an enzyme is a catalyst. So an enzyme, which naturally occurs in, in all vegetable product, anything that's grown, uh, stimulates chemical change without changing that catalyst. Many cereals, fungi, and bacteria produce enzymes that can convert starch into sugar. So we notice we mentioned fungi and bacteria here. The only fungi or bacteria we care about for our discussion here is, again, the yeast we're going to be using. Though for other types of production, fungi and et cetera are used. And this is the type of yeast we care about. So this is Saccharomyces cerevisiae, also known as budding yeast. It is the most common yeast used in all food and beverage production in the modern world. It's not the only type, but 99.9999 whatever of yeast used to make bread, to make wine, to make beer, to make cider and to make distilled spirits is going to be some form of Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Now I want you all to think about this family of yeast as if it were dogs. So the family canine. When you think about a dog and that whole family canine, you have your German shepherds, you have your Pekingese, you have your English sheep dogs, you have your Irish setters, and those dogs are all bred for certain purposes. They all look a little different, they act a little different, um, they behave a little different, um, they do different things as working dogs. Some dogs are lap dogs, some dogs are guard dogs, some dogs are herding dogs. You get my point. Well, Saccharomyces cerevisiae is a family or a species like canine. And within that species, just like a dog has breeds, you have strains of, th of this particular species of yeast. And those would be your champagne yeast, your M-type yeast for whiskeys, your ale yeasts, your, your, your baker's yeast that are used for making certain types of bread. And each one of those yeasts is cultivated and bred because they are living creatures for a specific purpose. And each one of those is gonna give you a different level of yield and a different family of conjugars or flavor compounds 
when you make your products. Now, other fat types of yeast are occasionally used in alcohol beverage production. Um, Circovisa cerevisae, God, I just totally brutalized that, I apologize. Palm is a fission yeast that's used in making um, sugar brandies called cachaça in Brazil and used in making, among other things, banana beer in Kenya. Now that is a yeast that reproduces by, uh, by, by fission, so splitting in two, where the yeast we normally use creates buds that break off, as you can see in the slide here. So that yeast is, is, is an entirely different species and is as closely related to the yeast we normally use as a dragonfly would be to a dog. So I hope that I hope that gives you a feel for when we talk about yeast, what we're talking about. So when you're selecting your yeast to make your rye whiskey, you're going to want to probably want to stay with something in the budding yeast family, the Saccharomyces cerevisiae family. And most whiskeys are done using various forms of what is known as an M type yeast. So as you look at your various yeast labs, if it's got an M designator of some sort, it's probably a whiskey yeast. So the yeast must be, and this is incredibly important, the yeast cells must be alive and must be in a water suspension, such as a mash or a wort. If your yeast dries out, unless it's been dried to put it into stasis, it will die. Now, briefly, and I don't have a slide on this, you're gonna see several types of yeast used in whiskey production. You have liquid yeast, you have cream yeast, you have dry yeast, and you have uh, what is called cake yeast. So your liquid yeast is exactly what it sounds like. It's a yeast that's been bred, it's in a liquid suspension, it's alive, it's active. If you're gonna do this at your distillery, you're probably gonna want some sort of a yeast lab to maintain it. It's got a very short shelf life, and you're gonna pitch that into your, your mash, your sugar solution. It's alive, it's active, it's, it's ready to go. Your cream yeast has a little longer shelf life and is basically a denser form of a liquid yeast. Um, in both cases, you're gonna need to be able to maintain it, refrigerate it, and it doesn't last all that long, maybe a couple of weeks. Your dry yeast, which is what you see in your smaller breweries and distilleries, most larger distilleries maintain stockpiles of this for safety purposes in case their live yeast or their cream yeast dies, if you will. Um, is shelf stable for several years. Typically comes vacuum packed in either half kilo bricks or 10 kilo bags. And if you go to your home brew shop or wine shop, your little packets of powdered yeast you get, those are all dry yeast. And then last but not least, you have the, the pressed or cake yeast that commercial bakers use for bread and other types of food production. Now, the reason I mention this is probably as large as 70 to 80% of the alcohol spirits worldwide are not produced with distiller's yeast. They're produced with just generic pressed yeast like a baker would use. So you can make whiskey using that yeast, but you're gonna get a different result than if you use a yeast that was specifically bred for whiskey production. And then we're gonna talk briefly about, about the life cycle of fermentation. And you know we're talking about rye, but this applies across the board for alcohol. And we have four phases. We have your lag phase, and this is where your yeast has just been introduced to your sugar solution or your mash. You have your aerobic phase, and this is where the yeast is using up the oxygen in that liquid solution. And predominantly what's happening here is it is producing more yeast cells. Once it gets to your stationary or anaerobic phase, it's, it stops reproducing or it begins to slow down dramatically in the reproduction of yeast cells. And this is the money phase, if you will. This is where the bulk of your ethanol is gonna be produced. Now, this is important to understand because if you muck around in your fermenters, if you stir your fermenters up, you'll add more oxygen in your fermenter, you'll push it back into the aerobic phase and you'll get more yeast cells, but you'll get less ethanol because there's only so much sugar to be digested in your solution. 
And then last, but certainly not least, is your, your exponential decline or death phase. And this is where yeast is, is basically dying off because the quantity of alcohol in the solution has gotten to the point where the yeast can no longer survive and it's running out of sugars for food. Now, little key point here. In commercial distilleries, very often they will look to do as rapid a distillate or fermentation as possible because they want to turn those fermenters because fermenter space is typically the biggest bottleneck in whiskey manufacturing. What's important here to understand is at the very end of this death or exponential decline phase on this chart is where the bulk of your complex flavor components come from. So if you cut off your fermentation early, you're gonna get a flatter whiskey. If you allow your fermentation to be to fully complete, you're gonna get a more complex whiskey. So now we're gonna talk about cereals. And obviously the cereal that we're most concerned about is rye, but that's not the only cereal we're gonna talk about. And even with a rye whiskey, it's not the only cereal we're gonna use. So a typical rye mash whiskey, as you can see here uh, on the left, and this is a very simple mash. Most of your rye whiskeys historically are made with between 50 and 80% rye, a little bit of corn, and then malted barley. In contrast, bourbon's gonna have that flipped. And there's as many different variations of of percentages as you can as, as you can think of that have been used. A lot of your books on bourbon and rye will say there's only three or four, but if you look back historically, every distiller has their own sort of take on this. Now, the other thing that's important to note is when in the early days of whiskey production around the world, people would use whatever grain they could ferment on. Over time, they would come up with mash bills they gave them a flavor they would like, but they were also very closely tied to the grains that were being produced where they were distilling. So in the early days of American distilling, you first had your Dutch and your German immigrants that came with and started distilling rye. At the same time, you had a very large wave uh, beginning late 1600s all the way into the 17 and 1800s of of English, Scottish, and Irish distillers. And they had a tradition in, in, bo in both Scotland and Ireland and to a lesser extent in England of distilling multi-grain whiskeys based on whatever they had. In Ireland, because Irish whiskey became the predominant uh, drink of the British Empire pre-1922, they would grab anything they could unmalted barley, malted barley, wheat, rye, oats, etc., and they'd fold them into that mash bill. Much the same happened in Scotland, but because barley was heavily grown in Scotland pre-1922, and because after the, the embargo, the economic embargo of Ireland uh, after Irish independence in 1922, the British then um, wanted to increase whiskey production very quickly, they focus very heavily on barley because it's very easy to make whiskey from. You saw a lot more barley being grown. So you had these Scottish and Irish distillers coming into the US in the 1800s, late 1700s, early 1800s, mid 1800s, and they were used to distilling off of any grain they could get their hands on. So they show up in the US and in the US, the predominant grain as we discussed was rye. So, most of your whiskey became a rye, but you'll notice there's corn and barley in there. So rye by itself, you're gonna need some sort of enzyme input. Barley has a much higher level of enzyme than any other grain. Rye also needs to be cooked as does corn, as does wheat, as does other grains to a very high level, which kills the enzyme. So you would take and add barley to give you additional enzyme. And then they would add corn or other grains if for no other reason than to reduce the viscosity of that mash so they could effectively move that material around and make a whiskey out of it. Rye by itself has, is notorious for turning into cement when you cook it. 
and then you can't get it out of your mash tun yet, tun yet get it into your still. So you always wanna add a little bit of other grain if you can. So typical rye whiskey mashes would have 70, 60, 50% rye, 51% rye if it's in the US by law, added corn, added barley, and they might have other things. Now, bourbon was made historically as well, especially where they were producing corn. And then when America went into prohibition, because so much whiskey was being made from rye, when whiskey became illegal in the US, the farming of rye decreased rapidly. And those farmers switched to a crop they could sell, which was feed corn. So post-prohibition in 1935, suddenly everybody wants to distill again. And rye is a much less common raw fermentable than corn. So America went from being predominantly a rye whiskey country to predominantly a bourbon country very quickly because that was the grain that was readily available. And if you look at <coughs> these two mash bills, you'll notice that they're pretty much laid out the same way. It's just pre-prohibition rye was more common, post-prohibition corn was more common. So wherever you're producing around the world, if you're gonna look at rye, you might wanna look at what is common and what your costs are gonna be on production. Because that was the underlying driving factor for why we have different mash bills historically. Now, arguably, if you're looking at rye, you probably wanna look at rye because of it, the difference in flavor, the difference in texture, et cetera, in the modern world, but you're gonna pay a price for that depending where you are. So let's talk about processing grains now. So again, we're looking at rye. Um, rye, wheat, even corn, and certainly barley, when they come out of the field, they typically have a fairly high level of moisture content, depending where you are. Um, a lot of times you'll see, at least in my part of the world and much of Europe, you're gonna have moisture rates somewhere between 40 and 60% when that grain is harvested. So we're, the, what's gonna happen is you're gonna wanna dry that grain. And this is actually a barley drying oven, but, but rye, it could dry rye just as easily. I just happen to have a good photo of, of a barley drying oven. Um, and they're taking the grain, they're, they're taking it out of the truck that you see on the lower right. They're putting it into this long conveyor belt in this oven. And they're drying it to about 14% moisture. At that point, the grain can then be stored in silos until you're ready to use it. Then you're gonna mill it. And this is a typical four roller mill. Uh, you see two and four roller mills used around the world for rye, for wheat, very seldom for corn, um, but certainly for barley. And with this four roller mill, um, obviously you see a feed roll at the top. The first two rollers will crack the malt, so it'll force the, the, the kernels, um, the barley corns, the, uh, the rye corn um, particles between the two rollers, which will break it down. Then you've got some screens for separation. Then you've got a second set of rollers. Uh, I use a four roller mill here at Golden Moon um, for our barley. Uh, we have put rye through it, but we typically don't. We typically will, will go to another mill just to keep things clean and segregate. Uh, but that's because we do a lot more malt whiskey here at Golden Moon than we do rye or bourbon or Irish pot still. Uh, we run them all. We do a lot of prototyping for people. So we process a variety of different grains, but our in-house mill is a four roller mill. Again, here's another picture inside showing a two roller mill with the grain coming in to the roll, uh, rollers as whole kernels and being turned into grist, which is a mixture of flour, grits and husk. And then you see a hammer mill. Now our hammer mill is the most common way you're gonna see in modern distilleries to process uh, raw wheat, corn, and most importantly for our discussion, rye. And a hammer mill basically drops the grains into a, into a drum of some sort with a variety of metal hammers that spin at high volume and pound those kernels against the walls of that drum 
And as you can see, there's perforations and the perforations in those, uh, uh, in the walls of that drum will allow the, the grist to come out the other end. And then in some cases, we're gonna want to malt our grain. Now, obviously we talked about malted barley as an enzyme source. We're always gonna malt barley when we're making a rye whiskey or for that matter, any multi-grain whiskey, because we want to use that as an enzyme source unless we're using artificial enzyme. But we also very typically, you'll see people malting rye, they'll malt wheat and they'll malt oats. And rye is very, very commonly uh, malted before distilling does not need to be. And when you malt it, you're gonna get a different flavor. But malting is really where you're tricking that seed, if you will, into starting to grow. You're gonna start by soaking it. And by soaking it, you're hydrating it. And then you're going to set it out in a moist environment. And these are all barley uh, malting operations, but malting rye is exactly the same, it looks just the same. And the, and the end goal is the same. You're gonna trick it into starting to grow. You're gonna trigger those, the, the seed into starting to produce larger quantities of enzyme and just to slightly start converting the starches in the seed into sugar. And then you're going to kiln it, heat it up to stop that growth and dry it out so that you can use it later. The next thing we're gonna worry about is gelatinization. Now for all grain gelatinization is the same. The pictures you have here are of corn starch, but you're gonna get starch in barley, wheat, rye, corn, et cetera. In all cases, the starch is in the grain in packets. So as you can see on the figure on the left, the packets are very small. Think of them like balloons filled with air, but instead they're filled with starch. Now, as you heat up your grain, those packets are going to swell. And what we want those packets to do is we want them to pop like a balloon would pop if you heat it up. And that is called gelatinization. Now for barley, gelatinization occurs at a very low temperature, which means that your enzymes, your catalysts stay intact. But for rye, for wheat, for corn, you're going to need to heat it up to a point where you kill your enzymes and keep going. So to the point where you gelatinize the, those grains. So once you're done with your, your rye, your wheat, your corn, you're gonna get almost a porridge where you cook the grain. Now it has, it's been fully gelatinized, but it no longer has enzymes that will allow those starches to convert to sugar. So at this point, you're gonna to need to add some sort of an enzyme. Now, historically, people let the grain cool at this point and then add barley for the enzyme before they mash. And mash is the process of conversion of starches into sugars so that the yeast can eat it. In the modern era, you'll occasionally see people using, making whiskeys out of quote, 100% rye or 100% corn or 100% wheat. And that's actually not a true statement because if you're not adding barley as an enzyme source, or you're not adding raw grain of some other sort as an enzyme source, then you're adding an artificial enzyme, which means you're not really using 100% of whatever grain you're talking about anyway. So what we're gonna do with this is we've now taken, we've cooked our grain, and now we're gonna introduce an enzyme. And there's three enzymes we're gonna talk about today. The first is alpha amylase. And alpha amylase naturally occurs in all your, your plant material. And it converts starches, which are stored in the seed, into sugars by breaking down the, uh, the starch molecules so that they become a sugar so that, that the plant can grow in its young stages. But more importantly, it becomes food that our yeast can eat. When the yeast eats that food, it literally consumes the sugar and its feces is CO2, alcohol, and those few other things we talked about. So alpha amylase is gonna give you a certain piece of your conversion 
by breaking off pieces of the molecules at different points. The other enzyme we care about for conversion is beta amylase. And obviously you see it's got different temperatures, which is why you wanna make sure when you're mashing, you touch multiple temperatures so that you activate those enzymes and allow them to convert the various pieces of those starch molecules into sugars. Now, I prefer to use barley as a natural enzyme source for these two enzymes, which is why I, like historical distillers, will use six to 10% of barley, of malted barley, in my mash bills for my bourbon, my rye, and even for my pot stills. And then the last enzyme we're gonna talk about is beta-glucanase. Now, the reason we wanna talk about beta-glucanase specifically for rye whiskey production is beta-glucanase improves the viscosity of a mash by breaking down the beta-glucans. Now, I use an artificial added beta-glucanase whenever I'm working with rye grain specifically, because as I mentioned before, rye has a nasty habit of turning into cement. It's very thick, it's very sticky, and if you don't add a little beta-glucanase, you can run into problems and the, there's nothing worse than having to take and crawl into your mash tun with a scoop and scoop out semi-solid, you know, grain mash that is so thick it won't, you can't pump it. So if you're going to make rye whiskey, a little bit beta, of beta-glucanase will be well worth it. It's the only artificial enzyme I prefer to use. So now we're going to talk about mashing. And I want to start by talking about a barley mash just because it's a good illustration of how the enzymes interact with the conversion. Now, this is a typical Scottish mash. It's what's known as a three water mash. So in the brewing world, in places other, outside of Scotland, it might be called a step mash. But what the Scottish typically do is they're gonna put water into their mash vessel with their grain. And that water is going to be heated to about 62 to 65 degrees Celsius, which is optimal for your beta amylase. They're going to let it sit for a while. They may recirculate it. Every distiller has got a different process, or most distillers have a variation of the same process. Um, and they're going to let that beta amylase, which is resident in the barley, do its job with converting. They're going to take that liquid, they're going to pull it off and they're gonna, they're gonna let it cool. They may run it through a heat exchanger because uh, if you let it cool on its own, you can, you can get other microorganisms growing in it, lactobacilli, et cetera, which affect flavor. Your second water is going to be uh, optimal for alpha amylase. Again, it's more conversion. And you're gonna take and you're gonna hold that around 70 C. And you're gonna let your, your enzymes convert what's left of that starch and that grain into sugar, and then you're going to pull that water off. And then in Scotland, it's very common to see a third water and sometimes even a fourth water. And what this water does is it, it, it flushes out all the remaining fermentables and it becomes the first water of the next batch. This is all done when you're lottering and this is all for 100% barley. And the note on this, on this last water is it's hot enough that it flushes out the remaining fermentables that are stuck in the, the solids in the grain, but it also kills your enzyme. So for making single malt, that's the approach you're gonna take. For making a multi-grain whiskey such as a rye, you're gonna take roughly the same approach except you're going to mash and leave the solids in. Remember, we've already, we've already cooked the rye, the wheat, the, uh, the corn, to the point where it's a porridge and you can't really separate those solids. So you're gonna cook it and you're gonna heat it up to a point where you trigger your alpha and beta amylase. And so you're gonna change your temperature, allow your temperature to naturally curl, a uh, cool rather, through those temperature ranges. And then you're gonna take and you're gonna pump your solids all the way into your fermenter and you're gonna ferment on grain. Now I'm gonna emphasize something here. When you cook your grain, it's gonna be hot enough to kill enzyme. 
So before you start your quote unquote mashing process, even if you use the same vessel to cook your grain and mash, you need to make sure that you let your cooked grain cool to the point where it's not going to kill your, um, uh, your enzymes. And at that point, you can either introduce your barley, which is your enzyme source, or if you're gonna use an artificial enzyme, you can put your artificial enzymes in. So a mass vessel is really just a, a vessel that you use to heat things up in. It holds a mixture of grain and water. For malt whiskey, you're gonna lauder, which means you're going to, as you can see in this drawing, there's, a, there's a, uh, a screen on the bottom and your clear liquid comes off the top or off the bottom, and then you pull your grain out. For rye whiskey and other multigrain whiskeys, you're gonna pump, you're not gonna have the screen and you're just gonna pump everything out as a slurry and you're going to put that into your fermenter and ferment on grain. This is what a multi-grain large scale operation looks like. So as you can see where it's just raw material, we talked about our mill. You're going to run your grain through your mill. You're gonna add water, you're gonna mix it together. You're then going to cook it. And this flow chart shows them as separate vessels, but they may not be separate vessels, okay? Um, you're gonna cook your grains to break it down and cause that gelatinization. Then you see the liquefaction tank uh, that may in a large distiller be a separate vessel. In a smaller distiller, it may still all be one vessel. And that liquefaction tank, you'll notice that they're adding amylase. That amylase is, your, is where they're adding what would be your barley or your artificial amylase. So you can get, you can start getting your conversion from starch to sugar. Um, you'll notice that uh, they talk about a sacrification uh, tank, that is your conversion tank. Um, again, all of these may from this point on be one tank in a small to medium sized distiller, distillery that you use as a cooking and a mashing vessel. It would be called a mash tun. Um, and it may be nothing more than a jacketed tank with a big impeller in it. So you can move things around and control the temperature by, by putting steam or hot water into that jacket. Then you're gonna cool your mash. That may be, in this case, it says it's a mash cooling tank. Very common now, if you're gonna cool your mash down, you're gonna use some sort of a heat exchanger. And then you're gonna put it into your fermenter. And in this case, they show a yeast starter tank, which is actually a tank which allows you to grow liquid yeast. But when you go into your fermenters, however you're sourcing your yeast, you're gonna induce yeast into your fermenters, and then you're gonna go through that fermentation process. And that's the whole process to the point where you're ready to put into the still. This shows the whole process for pretty much every type of spirit you can think of. It's grossly oversimplified, but you see on the top level, you've got your starch-based fermentables. So that's corn, wheat, rye, barley, et cetera. Um, then you have below that, though it really should be adjacent to that, your, there are things that don't need to be mashed, things like molasses and sugar cane and whey and agave and sugar beet. And then you go into primary alcohol. And primary alcohol, you've got pot still and continuous still, both of which can be used to make pretty much any type of whiskey you want. Again, this is a gross oversimplification, but you'll notice on the continuous still side, your, your higher, more highly rectified products, you're gonna need a continuous still or some sort of hybrid still that has a column on it. And next we're talking, we need to look at fermenters. Now, the picture you see here are typical um, square uh, stainless fermenters. They're converted alcohol beverage totes. Um, they have a single jacket uh, for glycol on them. Um, that jacket, and this is what I use in my distillery, allows me to control the high, the high temperature. 
so that as my fermentation heats up, especially in the summer when it's hot here, um, I can drop that temperature a little bit to keep that temperature in an optimal range for the yeast. You also have other types of fermenters. And as we saw up here, I went up to, sorry about that. This is a wood fermenter. Uh, this is actually a fermenter at one of the big distilleries in Kentucky. Uh, it's made out of cedar wood. It's being used for both uh, bourbon and rye. And you can see there are solids in it and it's open fermented. Open fermenters versus closed fermenters really depends on your environment. If you have a lot of dust and a lot of other microorganisms in your environment, you may want to use a closed fermenter to keep them from getting into your ferment. If you like the biome in your environment and you want the added flavor that those other microorganisms give your, your whiskeys, you might want to leave them open. So back to where we were, fermenters. Uh, other materials that are used for fermenters are ceramic, either round or square. With stainless, you can have round fermenters like you would see for beer. A lot of your large commercial distilleries are using either soft steel, steel, or uh, aluminum around the world. Uh, round uh, steel or wood fermenters are common in both Scotland and Ireland. Um, so there's lots of things you can ferment in and people will even ferment in food grade plastic totes. If you're small, if you're getting started, it's a viable way to do that. Just realize that over time, that soft plastic material will get, will get scratched and those scratches become breeding grounds for bacterium, which can ultimately give you negative flavors in your, in your, in your final product and may render your final product, if it gets bad enough, undrinkable. So if you're gonna use plastic fermenters, be real anal about cleaning it, about sterilization and et cetera. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about stills a little bit. Um, this of course is again, the Mount Vernon still that we saw before, very typical of a still you would have seen as early as the 1500s and uh, stills that are sort of this configuration are still being used today. Um, it's a simple pot still with a boiler, a head, a vapor line and a condenser. This is a Scottish style uh, pot still, if you will. This happens to be my still at Golden Moon. Uh, this is my stripping still, my big whiskey still. Um, again, it has a boiler. It has a still head, in this case with a boil ball. Uh, it has a vapor line and it has a condenser. And one thing to note when you're looking at this still is this sump, the outlet on the bottom of the still is four inches across. The reason I have that large of an outlet is if I'm putting solids in a still, if I'm distilling on grain to make a rye whiskey, a bourbon, a wheat whiskey or a pot still, I want to be able to get those solids out of the still easily. If you're making a malt whiskey and you're laudering, you do not need that large of a sump on the bottom. But if you have a whiskey still that's designed solely to put liquid in, and you try and make a multi-grain whiskey where you're fermenting and distilling on grain, you're going to have to climb in that still and shovel it out at some point. And that's not any fun. If you're going to produce on an ongoing basis and produce multi-grain whiskeys, you need to make sure you have the ability to get the, the slurry, the porridge, if you will, out of the bottom of that still when you're done. So next, this is my spirit still, and that's me standing next to it to give you an idea of size. Um, this is a still I designed and built. Uh, it's based on an old German design that I happen to like. Uh, I use this for both a spirit still and in some cases for a wash or stripping still. And so I've designed it to be able to use for both uh, putting liquids in and putting mashes in. So if you'll notice on the bottom, again, there's a very large sump, but as you can see, there's a reduce on it because we've been running malt whiskey spirit on it. And I don't need to move a large amount of solids. I can use a smaller pump and reduce it down and move that liquid very quickly. 
Next, we have various types of calm or, 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 or continuous stills. Now, the one on the left is a classic coffee still. It contains two columns. One is called the rectifier, which is the one on the left. The other is called the analyzer, which is the one on the right. And this is really designed to make, to make whiskey on an ongoing basis, predominantly off of a wash. You can do it with grain, but the coffee still that would use the grain uh, would have chambers that were larger on the bottom because you're putting some solids in there. The still on the left, often called historically a continuous beer still, is what you commonly see in Kentucky and Tennessee here in the United States in your large producers. The still at Wild Turkey, the still at Four Roses, for example, are both this type of still. And it has one large column that you can put your mash your slurry into. It goes up into a secondary distillation chamber or vessel, often called a doubler, and then goes into a condenser. Next, we have a column still with a pot. Now, you see a lot of these in Europe. Um, most of your smaller stills by Carl Engineering, by Mueller, uh, by Bavarian Holstein, uh, are hybrid stills of a pot and a column. Um, the same with a lot of your Vendome pot stills here in the US. The particular still you're seeing here uh, is the still designed by David Pickerel, um, the late master distiller. Uh, it was built by Vendome Copper and Brass. Uh, this particular schematic is the still currently being used at Whistle Pig to produce their rye whiskey. And so last but not least, I wanted to talk just briefly about what gives whiskey its flavors. So first off, first and foremost, I would argue um, is what you start with. And that is grain, water, and yeast. Now your grains typically for distilling are rye that we're talking about, corn, wheat, and barley. There are other grains that can and are used. Um, green barley, oats, quinoa, a variety of other rice. All of those are used in the production of whiskey, but really if we're gonna make a rye whiskey and we're gonna kind of stay with, with what a rye whiskey is by tradition, you're going to be staying with a majority of rye with the balance being made of either corn or wheat or both with barley being added as an enzyme source and possibly a little oats. And so your rye is gonna give you a very earthy and spicy taste. Uh, terroir, so where the grain is grown with has a lot to do with that. Um, the way the grain has been processed, whether it's malted or not, will affect that flavor as well. Uh, your wheat is gonna give it a softness and almost a creamy note. Your corn is gonna give it a sugary note, um, not like a rum sugary, but when you drink a bourbon, you get a fair amount of sweetness from the corn. You're gonna get that sweetness in your rye whiskey. So you're balancing the different grains is going to give you um, uh, a different flavor profile. And then while your barley is viewed as a enzyme source, your barley is also going to give it a malty sweetness. Again, it's a different type of sweetness. that will add to the flavor and complexity of your whiskey. And then if you add a little oat, you're going to get a little bit of creaminess. Think about if you're making a cream stout beer and you're adding oats into it, you're going to get a touch of that creaminess off the oat into your whiskey as well. Next, we have water. Now, water is important. Water, if it's not clean, can cause problems in fermentation. Water that is clean is still potentially gonna have dissolved minerals in it. And those dissolved minerals will help with your fermentation potentially, depending on what they are. They will also influence flavor. But in your final spirit, especially if you're deproofing with water with a high mineral content, over time, you'll develop a flecking which means that the residual fatty compounds in your spirit, your lipids, 
which will show up in all spirits, will clump on to the dissolved mineral particles in the water and they'll create visible particles. So you need to take a look at your water, where you're getting it, what it, what it is, make sure that not only is it clean, but that you understand its chemical makeup and how it affects your fermentation and how it affects the final product if you use it for deep proofing. And then you need to adjust with chemicals or filtration or et cetera. Um, I don't like to use chemicals in my plant. Um, in my case, we have a high mineral content water uh, that we source that's Rocky Mountain runoff. Uh, it's great for fermentation. Uh, we then take and for deep proofing, we're going to hard filter. Um, we're going to take all those minerals out of that water for deep proofing. And we're going to use that perfectly clean water for deep proofing. And then we're going to deep proof and bottle. The next is your type of still. Every still is going to give you a little different result. Because all the factors that are involved in the shape of the still, the movement of the vapor, the efficiency of the still uh, are going to affect your final product. Now, and we're gonna go back up for a second when I'm talking about that. Distillers have a habit, especially newer distillers, of going out and buying the most efficient, highest tech still they can find. And the reality is that the science of distillation is optimizing that separation of your ethanol from everything else that's, that's, that, that's in your mash or your wash. The problem with that is that everything else is where the flavor comes from. So when you select your still, whether it be a, a simple pot still like this, or a little bit more complex of a still, or a much more efficient still like these, what you wanna understand is how to manage the inefficiencies of the distillation process so, so that you don't take too much out. Over-rectification will give you a flat spirit. So everything here is a trade-off. The more efficient you're still, the higher your yield, the more pure the alcohol, the less com complex your spirit is, the flatter and less remarkable your spirit is. So it's all a balance of efficiency and inefficiency. And then last but not least for ingredients is yeast. You're going to want to look at the type of yeast you want to use. As I said, for whiskey, most ye whiskey yeasts are M-type yeasts, but that doesn't mean you can't use other types of yeasts. As I said, most alcohol spirits in the world today are not produced on a M-type yeast or even a distiller's yeast. They're produced on a cake yeast that was designed for bulk food production. So you can experiment with different types and strains of yeast and see how they affect your yield, how they affect your fermentation time, and most importantly, how they affect your flavor. Okay, so we've talked about yeast, we've talked about stills. Let's talk about containers for half a second here. So whiskeys in Europe must be aged in wood for a minimum of three years. Japan and Australia and other countries, it's 24 months. In the United States, there's absolutely no aging requirement to be a whiskey. However, to be a straight whiskey, it's gotta be two years. And to be bottled in bond, it must be four years and it must all be done in the same bonded facility. Hence the name bottled in bond. The wood is historically oak though other woods can and are used around the world. In the US by law, it has to have the barrel or the container, it can be a box, has to be oak. Doesn't all, all have to be oak. So you can have a barrel, for example, with oak staves and Acacia <coughs> wood heads. Excuse me a second. Acacia wood heads. Do you want to just quickly say that a little bit again? <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> la 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 la. Get a frog in my throat. Jeez. All right. So in the U ready? Yep. And I'm ready. Go. Ready. Okay. 
So in the US, uh, the container must be oak, but it doesn't need to be solely made of oak. So for example, you can have a barrel that has oak staves and Akashi wood heads. Now the question is, why would you wanna do that? Oak is a very dense wood and different types of oak have different densities. Akasi is a very undense wood, which means you're gonna get a much higher level of oxygen passing through the barrel heads on, on a barrel that's oak staves with Akasi heads. So any barrel, any wood container is gonna breathe. And your maturation is always gonna be a combination of the extraction of your flavor compounds coming out of the oak, your terpenes, your tannins, your vanillins, because the alcohol is acting at that point as a solvent and is leaching some of that material out, dissolving it, if you will. Um, and your uh, interaction with the environment. So that's the air. And air that you're in is not just air. It contains air, but it also contains moisture. So where you mature is going to dictate how quickly you mature to a level and what evaporates more quickly, water or alcohol. Higher humidity environments and lower humidity environments are gonna give you very different results for the same amount of time in the barrel. Next, you have your size of barrel. So this is all about ratio of surface contact of your spirit to the wood itself. The smaller the barrel, the higher the surface content, contact, the higher the level of extraction. But at the same time, the lower the level of interaction with the air around that barrel. So the smaller the barrel, the darker your spirit is gonna get very quickly, but the less you're gonna have the effects of air and, and humidity on that spirit. So different size barrels will give you different results. Now, some people say small barrels are bad, good barrels are large. None of that's true. What's true is each size of barrel, each type of barrel is a different piece of the distiller's toolkit. So if you go to smaller distilleries that make brandy in Spain, <clears throat> if you go to some of the smaller family owned distilleries in Scotland, if you go to distilleries making brown spirit around the world that are not major producers, chances are you're going to see large numbers of different sizes and types of barrels because each one's gonna give you a little different level of extraction, a little different level of interaction with the environment. And then last but not least, the type of wood the barrel is made from and what's been done to that wood will affect the spirit. So if it's French oak versus American oak, for example, American oak is gonna give you a lot more spice and a higher level of extraction. French oak is gonna give you less spice, more perfumey notes, and because it's denser, a less level of extraction. Then the barrels have been either charred or toasted on the inside. And that level of color the barrel has on the inside and the amount of charcoal and creosote that is resident in that barrel will add, it, add different levels of color and flavor to your whiskey. And then if the barrel has previously held something else, port, sherry, another type of whiskey, whatever it previously held has absorbed into that wood and some of the characteristics of, of that other material, even molasses, or for that matter, even hot sauce. You put a whiskey in there, that whiskey's gonna leach some of that residual flavor from the previous material in that barrel into the whiskey. So all of those are gonna affect it. And then the temperature, air circulation, and et cetera, in the environment that the barrel is in will have an effect as well. So I think that's where I'm gonna stop. That's a lot of material. We covered it very quickly. Um, if people have questions, they're free to reach out to me and ask. Uh, 
You can find me on Facebook at goldenmoondistillery.com. Um, you know, I, I'm more than willing to answer, answer questions uh, if someone's trying to figure this out. And uh, I hope that this has been uh, educational and enjoyable. That is uh, just brilliant. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, uh, absolutely packed full of information. I think people will need to watch it um, at least twice, maybe more times and come back to it. Um, thank you so much for your time. It's always a pleasure to have you. Great friend of the Expo and the Distilling Conference. Uh, thank you everyone for watching and thank you to you, Steve. Cheers. Bye. Thank you.